And we're live. I can't see anything. Well, you should be able to see something now because we're actually live. We're a little bit late. What are we? Uh, episode 20, Brandon? 20. Episode 20. So we've got a little bit different studio this time. We've got some special guests with us. We've got. I'll leave you to last. I'll leave you last. They know you. I'm the fucking most special guest. <laughs> I'm the one who brought these motherfuckers. We've got Greg Anderson. <laughs> I sent some emails out earlier with his video that he posted. It's close to a million. Oh, it's like it's, 50 million. Is it at 50 million? It's All right. Ridiculous. So I was way off. Way the off. one on Instagram I saw, I was like almost 50 a million. million? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a different. Yeah, no, it million. got shared on Facebook. And gotcha. Yeah. It went wow. on Facebook. So yeah. law enforcement officer, former Army. Ranger. Yep. Right. We'll get into all of that. We've got Joao Assis, world or champion, world champion, world champion, seven time world champion, jiu jitsu world champion, baddest motherfucker on planet Earth. Yep. And then there's Greg Lappin. <laughs> so there's that. So anyway, we're going to do some admin stuff. We need to announce last week's giveaway winner, right? Yeah, last week was uh, it was another YouTube commenter on your channel. Uh, YouTube name is Crow Magnum, C R O W E Magnum. So, dude, if you're out there, send Luke an email, Luke at USACarry.com. They'll hook you up with what do we have? We have some pretty good stuff, right? I have to look back. It's like hats, t shirts, stickers, maybe a knife. Did you a give knife? away a knife? Yeah. Maybe you're giving away a knife every week. So, on that note, we give away stuff if you ask questions. So we'll be taking questions this week. I'm giving away hat, t-shirt, sticker patch, as usual. Brandon? Uh, sticker, knife, and one of those hats. One of those right hats. I don't have up here. That yeah. Nobody can see back there. It's, it's back there. It says Concealed Nation right where this thing is. <laughs> Um, how do they enter? They ask a question. Any question? Any question. So like a real question, not a, a oh, statement so, with a question no, mark behind no. it. Like what's going on, everyone? That so, he's so entered. He, he doesn't okay. qualify. He's entered. <laughs> yeah, Jessica says, Yay, Greg. Is that yeah. this Greg or that Greg? This Which Greg, Greg is it? We've got two Gregs here. Double your pleasure, double your fun, you know? <laughs> She's a regular. <laughs> Uh, let's see. We got Frank Rose. He Greg won squared. last week. <laughs> Greg squared, right? So anyway, ask questions when next week's giveaway. Watch next week's vi video and see if you win. So, so Greg, your video, what made you make that? And can you give them like a click notes version of what yeah, it is so if they haven't seen it? For the people that haven't seen it, basically, I was a patrol officer in Seattle, Washington for the last three years. I've been in law enforcement for about 10 and this whole coronavirus thing, I just felt like the elected officials, the mayors and the governors were misusing law enforcement officers and basically using us as the enforcement for their executive orders. And for us, I mean, our title is law enforcement officers, not executive order enforcement officers. And talking to my chain of command, talking to my chief, talking to my sergeant, talking to all my coworkers and my friends like across the nation, literally every single one of them was horrified seeing all the shit that's going on, like arresting people for going surfing right. and arresting people for playing catch with their daughters. And I mean, everybody was of the same mindset. Like if the government feels that we need to do this, they need to approach us in a manner where it's like a respectful request, not the threat of we're going to arrest you and we're going to cite you because right out of the gates that puts us as the patrol level officer in a confrontation right. with the citizens and it's an uphill battle as it is being a patrol level officer maintaining the public's trust and so after seeing this happening over and over and over and then also finding out that literally no officers support what they're seeing i was like it needs to come out from one of us in the uniform on duty saying, hey, this is not what we stand for. This is not what we should be doing. And this is not what the American public thinks that we should be doing. And so I just held my phone up. It wasn't like some scripted thing where I like 
had some agenda like there's so many fucking conspiracy theories about it right now you're an actor you're not even yeah real. i know i'm a Wait. paid i'm a paid, you're a paid actor i'm a paid actor <laughs> for, How much you pay for that, is <laughs> yeah. it per impression yeah, yeah i don't know so you have like you'd, 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 you'd have now? to ask them <laughs> but uh yeah i made that video and and that's exactly what the video was touching on it was talking about how that's not our role if they want us to educate the public then it needs to be presented as that and even that's like that's not our job but i get it this is kind of new territory for everybody right so if they want officers on the streets talking to people asking them to adhere to the governor's request so be it but once they're telling us to go out there check for papers like i had a buddy who i was in ranger regiment with the dude's a fucking war hero he has pulled over twice saying where are your papers showing your essential and this was in nevada you can't be on the roadways in, unless you're essential and a couple more things like that i just fucking had it and i was like listen like i deployed 14 times for this country and i'm not just gonna take a back seat and not say anything when every single person that i talk to feels a certain way and so i made that video expressing those feelings and it just went fucking viral like almost so you posted that to your instagram account yeah so instagram. before that like how many followers or like was it just your like, kind of what? like thir 13 three <laughs> two or three <laughs> 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 yeah that's, that's a funny story we'll get into that but me and greg became homies on instagram uh, like a couple of years ago just because of that picture where he was standing with his gear and then he was standing with his gi okay and it's I, like, I was thinking of a different picture i was thinking the silky so my concho silky. <laughs> those, those are private text yeah. okay <laughs> gotcha but uh yeah so i mean I, w I had like 1300 followers on Instagram. I'm just a normal dude. I'm a cop that has three kids in a Jiu Jitsu Academy, you know, and uh, it went fucking nuts. So it's been good though. I mean, and by good, I lost my job. Well, so there's a question. So are you still in law enforcement or is it still pending? All right. Or? So Jessica Howell. Yeah. Um, anyone that's ever worked for the government understands that the government moves like pond water. Everything takes an eternity. So I was put on what's called paid administrative leave on May 6th because they wanted to investigate. Basically, they're saying that it was uh, a violation of policy because I was online during when I was on duty in uniform. But that's just all they're just figuring out a way to make it work because guys are on the Internet in their uniform literally every single day. It's never been an issue before. Right. But they put me on leave pending the investigation and then they contacted me and said greg the video has to come down and i said well what do you mean it has to come down Explain it was fine me. at first it right? was fine at first yeah at first the yeah the patrol Before commander got so many impressions the patrol commander actually hit me up the next day and was like hey we really support your message good on you we're behind you like cool you know and then and this is just my theory but i've had people tell me that it came down from the governor's office they're like hey that needs to be pulled right because i i openly said defy your governor defy your mayor you have to stand up for what you believe is right not what some elected official tells you is right because what the law tells you to do versus what's morally and ethically correct sometimes those things are in contrast and so i i, I implored officers to look into their own hearts and if something feels wrong if i'm putting handcuffs on a lady because she's pushing a four-year-old on a swing and that feels wrong to you it's probably because it's wrong right so you need to take a step back and be like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. And so the rumor mill has it. There's no confirmation that it came down from the governor's office that this guy needs to go. And they told me to take it down. And I told my chief straight up, I'm like, listen, the whole point of putting that video out there was that you need to stand up for what you believe is right. Even if it does cost you your career, even if it does get you in trouble, how can I put that message out there and implore people to stand up for what they say or what they believe is right. And then as soon as somebody says, Hey, go ahead and you need to rescind your words or, or else if I tuck tail and run, I'm going to lose all my friends. Right. Everyone's going to think I'm a bitch the rest of my life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's funny. Uh, YouTube pulled it down or, mm -hmm. you know, no. So I was like, yeah. Hey, for my own credibility, the video has to stay. Right. And if that means you have to fire me, then that's you guys figure out what you have to do. And so they brought me in and, and we did like a two hour internal affairs investigation. And that was May 27th. And I haven't heard a peep since. So you haven't no. heard anything since not, May. Nope. Not one, not an email, not a text, not a phone call, nothing. But right, I got a question for you. Go ahead. The, um, I, I watched your, one of your follow-up videos. It was the one right after you posted that video. 
And he said that they, wh whoever you spoke with first there, when you had a couple thousand views on the video, they were like, awesome, good job, right? And yeah. then once it got to something like a couple hours later and you were around 400,000, yep. I think he said then, then it became a problem. Yeah, they said uh, it's, I think the, the exact quote was, Greg, it's time to pull the plug on this thing. It's getting too big. And you're like, I'm like, well, if a couple hours ago it was a good message right, and it's gaining right. traction, wouldn't that right. be better? Right. Some but more that, people are seeing so, it. That's applying logic to the government, though. So for people, for people who weren't here at the very beginning, um, what, what what's the view count look like now? I know it's on Instagram and Facebook, but what any idea on the combined? I mean, I, one share alone on Facebook got 15 million. That's on wow. one share. That's somebody copied your video, posted it. Or... Well, it went okay. So when it's funny how this worked out. Because I'm not super tech savvy, and I shared it we're on my the, Instagram. We're the tech nerds, <laughs> me and him. Yeah. So I shared it on my Instagram, uh -huh. but since it wasn't a regular post, it was IGTV. Uh -huh. Instead of going to my regular Facebook, it went to my business. It went to Electric Jiu Jitsu's Facebook. Oh, okay. And so if you guys have seen that, all of my longer videos that I post on Instagram went to Electric Jiu Jitsu. Okay. And then people started sharing it on Facebook from there. And so one of the shares there, and it was a guy that has a, uh, his name's Steve Sanchez. He has some like talk radio show out of Vegas. Okay. He got 15 million views on that share alone. Yeah, and crazy. then, and, and now it's on YouTube and Twitter and all these, but I don't have any of that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, who knows where it's at, but yeah, it went nuts. I'm getting a request to talk into the mic if we can, or pull it to you. <laughs> like that, this? that was him. Right here. <laughs> that was actually for you. Oh, you're talking to me? Yeah. The uh, way you're talking. I just can't turn my head and look at him, apparently. All right. Greg's doing fine. You're the one that's a mess. All right. Well, I'll just leave and y'all can talk. <laughs> so what are you doing now? Um, I started my own podcast. It's called The Endless Endeavor. And uh, I got hit up by a lot of people that are like, hey, based on your videos, we'd like to hear more, more content from you. We'd like to hear your thoughts on this and that and hear about your army experience and hear more about jujitsu. So I was like, you know what? I got time on my hands now. So it's, it's training jujitsu. It's working out and it's, it's doing the podcast. It's been good. Cool. And it's awesome. I know the guy and I'm listening to his podcast. So check it out and listen endeavor. Yeah. I just posted a link in the comments to the YouTube, uh, version of it but you can find it on apple yeah we're on apple, apple and, and, and stuff, right? i always direct people to apple or spotify depending if they're android or apple but right i guess it's on a million little hosts too i don't really know how that works but cool. it's going out there everywhere so brandon are you looking through these comments see if we have any questions or anything yeah I'm, I'm looking obviously i mean we've got three jujitsu owners in the gym so if anybody yeah, so wait, let's go to jujitsu gym owners. Let's go back to how this 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 motley trio. Yeah, like why um, why are all these how people this motley here? Tri dude? It's crazy. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm gonna let. Ready? All right, so we'll I'm go we'll go know. way back to let's 20 go. 2011, and I was a brown belt, not a very good brown belt. I found out, <laughs> and I was living in Seattle, and I got hired by the U.S. Marshal Service, and that agency ended up stationing me in Los Angeles, California. So I moved to Los Angeles as a brown belt. And it's like, okay, what, what gym am I going to work out at now? I got to find a new gym. And I basically just opened up Google Maps and looked at what gyms are along my commute and then did a little bit of research about them. And uh, if you're a jiu-jitsu guy and you're listening, you've probably heard of Marcus Almeida, Bushesha. I didn't go there because I knew who he was. I went there because he's the only guy that ran class at 7 p.m., <laughs> and, and I could make, yeah, and it, it worked with it worked with my work schedule. So I went in there and uh, signed up and started training with dudes that are monsters. And I real I, I remember telling Bushesha like one of my first practices with him. I said, "Bro, start me back over at white belt. No hard feelings. Like <laughs> this is a different thing down here. I don't want to have this brown belt around my waist. Start me back over at white belt." He's like, "Oh, Greg, no man. Like you earn you 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 train hard and and just represent that belt as best you can." And so I ended up training with him for a couple years and then he introduced me to Joao. And I don't know if you remember this, Joao, the, the first moment we met, he came to, to do some work with the marshal service. And, uh, the first thing he said to me, like, bro, do you like the coffee? 
I said, yeah, I fucking love coffee. He's like, man, before we train, let's go get coffee. And I was like, my guy right here. And uh, I remember, like, we just had a good time. He trained a bunch of guys for at my agency, and we just clicked. And I remember going home, uh, telling Jenny, I was like, that's who I need to get. That's who I need to get my black belt under. Like, because jujitsu is more, it's not just about technique, and it's not about, like, you know how good guys are obviously that plays a role but a big part of it is finding guys you click with lifestyle yeah culture, right and, and you find those dudes that are that are, like we we're literally just talking about this in the car you find those dudes that are part of your tribe and it's like okay this is my new home and after i met joao timing was good because marcus actually stepped away from coaching because he was getting super famous in the jiu-jitsu world big superstar and i was like dude electric jiu-jitsu is my new home and uh you know, I would commute. I was living in Lake Elsinore. And for anyone that's not familiar with that, it was like 50 miles out of the way every night to go train at electric jujitsu. Cause I knew I was like, this is, this is who I need to invest my time. And this is where I want my lineage to be. And, uh, <clears throat> fuck man. I was with you for a couple years yep. and got my black belt under Joao and then, uh, <clears throat> ended up moving back home to Seattle and opening up my own Academy. Um, for those that, aren't familiar with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or, you know, for those maybe that are hobbyist practitioners, let's kind of break this down. Joao, the man sitting across the table from me, <laughs> seven time world champion, seven time world champ since purple belt being winning world championships, like every rank low for the last almost 12 years. Yep. Like, not the finals, you know, have some few goals, but I have some few silvers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like the, yeah. The, yeah. Right? we forget about the silver, but of yeah. course it's been many, many finals through through the career, traveling all over the world and competing in many, many uh, countries, different people. Learning, ADCC. Uh, ADCC. For those of you that don't know what ADCC is, it's, it stands for Abu Dhabi Combat Club. And it was started by one of the crown princes in Abu Dhabi. Um I want to say back in uh, the late nineties, yeah, late nineties, kind of shortly after the UFC started in the early nineties, and uh, the ADCCs is like the Super Bowl and the Stanley Cup, I and think it's more for, wrapped in. For, I think it's more like no Olympic gi. Games, Olympic shit. Games of no gi, know, gi like the World Championship, yeah. yearly. It's the best way, but yeah. it's it's big, it's huge. But you have the Olympic Games that it's just you know like for every other year and you have like maybe if you're the best in some years you don't gonna make it because you don't you know what i mean you're gonna reach that yeah. your peak with the, the the competition dates and just like olympic games happen right so it's something that every year you have few world champions but it's, it's, it's like you know like olympic olympic games champions so it's one in many it's it's a little more um important let's say yeah right it's like that that has this because it comes from from a king yeah. from the emirates so it has this vibe this magical thing around you know for many time for many years it was the the, the biggest paycheck in jiu-jitsu right and it comes and from the very beginning used to come with like uh diamond watches yeah, diamond watch from the prince. <laughs> yeah i didn't get the time you didn't get they, don't, they don't dude they don't um, play in the watch unfortunately <laughs> 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 You know, Greg, uh, you know, so Joao, like, before he retired, one of the best in the world and, like, still one of the baddest dudes in the world. And then Marcus uh, Buchecha Almeida, Buchecha is his, his nickname, um, right now I still think stands currently as the winningest black belt. Bro, my Buchecha, it's in, you know, you have all the the, the, the champions, the tough yeah. guys, the dudes, but you have the, that one or – Two yeah. guys like the Michael Phelps of yeah, the Buchecha. Michael Jordan, right? Yeah. And Buchecha did that, you know. He's like on the on the Guinness World Records yeah. book, you know, like as the the biggest champion of all times. Uh, probably is one of the guys who made the most uh, money in Jiu Jitsu too, with all the the prize he got. The, because he, when he became the the profession, when he became who he is, yeah. he got this beginning of the the pro Jiu Jitsu boom. You right. know? He, like yeah. they're, they're not just paying, but they were paying like big big checks for the time. You know, so he he cleaned up the the whole thing. You know, like he, he and, and became and now probably gonna take like a generation to. 
to catch up with him, yeah. you know. So uh, fortunately, we are from the same family, you know. Like I saw Bushesh on the blue belt, you know, yeah, yeah, competing yeah. in Sao Paulo, like. And you know, they're the. I mean, these are like the most humble, nicest, chillest dudes you'll ever meet, and that's kind of that's what I want to you know, make sure we stress is that Greg. That Greg, not this Greg. That the Greg, the handsome one, <laughs> the, the <laughs> handsome other one. Uh, you know, he got to train under guys that were like world, world champions and the coolest, chillest dudes. Which then kind of circles around to how we met. Another cool dude. <laughs> Carry on. So, <laughs> or it might not be quite as cool. Uh, oh, no, it's it's funny. He uh Greg posted a picture and you know how in like the world of Instagram someone reshares it and reshares it and it was the picture of him in his police uniform like the SWAT gear and then also side by side with him in his gi. And I think it was like one of the big jiu-jitsu brands or something posted that. It wasn't Vita Jiu-Jitsu. I think I think Shoya Roll. So yeah, one of those it. so one of those Shoya Roll gi and I think Shoya Roll I didn't know it. who who you were and then I saw that picture and then being a cop myself and a jiu-jitsu guy is like, oh, that's a pretty cool or picture. Noose Defiel. Uh, maybe Noose Defiel. Yeah, I don't remember. But anyways, I clicked it and I was like, and then just started following him. I was like, oh, this, this dude seems pretty cool. And I remember I commented at one point in time, like, bro, whenever I'm in the South, I'm going to come down and check out your academy. It'd be cool. And then fast forward, what, two years? I'm at, like, I'm at one of my best friend's house in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And in walks this motherfucker. Because he was in one of my best friends' house in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So we didn't know we had a mutual friend that's like a straight homie. And uh, we were both at his house at the same time. I'm like, the fuck are you doing here? He's like, what the fuck are you doing here? And then it was just a bromance after that. Yep. So and good. then and I was there. I was there. Yeah, I saw yeah, everything. Was that. that's, I saw how I, <laughs> that's how I met Joao. Joao owns uh electric jiu-jitsu in huntington beach and it's a check mat affiliate check mat is a, a massive international uh jiu-jitsu team affiliation greg owns electric jiu-jitsu north and which is a check mat gym and i own vita jiu-jitsu which is a check mat gym and turns out greg and i worked for the same company really back in the same years mm -hmm. just in different aos yeah. and never met we both worked for triple canopy contracting overseas and that's so we had mutual friends through that that's how he knows yeah. seth and that yeah, was just funny how that all came together now we're all here with ugly ears choking <laughs> each other and shooting guns and, you know just to, yeah no, it's coming. <laughs> my ears are okay just to, now. to circle back around though <laughs> and and touch on like the jiu-jitsu world with joao and marcus and like how i got immersed in all that it's it's interesting because you know once you're in that environment and you're training with those guys, I always describe it as, you know, where you aren't, mm -hmm. you know, you know, <laughs> there's levels to this game and, and I'm not there. And, and the reality is I'll probably, I'll, I'll never be there, but my students back at my Academy, I think I've told you guys this story before. They'll ask me like, so when, when you roll with like Joao or you roll with Marcus and you, you know, let's say you roll 10 times, do you win five and, and they win five or <laughs> Look at him. Yeah. kind of <laughs> uh, if he's feeling really nice. And I was like, just to fucking like, and because they're white belts and I'm a black belt that can just do whatever I want to them, to them. I'm basically like a Bushesha, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I'm not going to even attempt to ride this because if he hears about it, I said, let me, let me just put this out here. Let me, let me, show you them play with. Yeah. <laughs> let me okay, clarify. Let, go, let me clarify this right now. I said, if I'm rolling with Marcus or Joao, if I roll 100 times, I get submitted 100 times by whatever the fuck they want. That's the reality of it. There's levels to this. There's black belts. Like I like to think of myself as a pretty good black belt. And then there's black belts that eat black belts like me and make, make us feel like white belts. Like that's just, the guys at the top of the game are at a level that like, like Joao said, it's the Michael Phelps of jujitsu, you know? So, but that's good though. I mean, it, I've, I've reached one time in my jujitsu career where I thought I was pretty badass, And that's when I was a new Brown belt outside of Seattle. Cause I was smashing everyone in my gym and I did some MMA fights and I was like, dude, like, I'm a fucking pretty tough dude. <laughs> and then I realized, no, you just weren't fighting guys 
are that are real tough dudes. There's yeah. always, yeah. There's, no matter how tough you are, man, there is always somebody tougher. Than yeah. yeah, no joke. <laughs> but it's a good <laughs> lesson because, like, that's what keeps you hungry. That's what keeps you training. You know, like, and that's what keeps you, more importantly, from being an asshole and inconsiderate to people. Because look, <clears throat> we got a bunch of pretty tough dudes in this room, and I'm definitely not at the top of that toughness, you know, like, but here's the thing. We all know our pecking order in here. We all know our pecking order and what he's at the top, <laughs> right? We all know that he's at the top. Jiu -jitsu with the Guillaume, with the set of rules, you know, ah, yeah, yeah, bullshit. You bullshit. Still have to no rules. The gun, the hand is, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, if, if this was like 2000 years ago, we'd be plowing your field. Here you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, Give us earlier, a little slice of bread. Yeah. Earlier, he was talking about doing some stuff tomorrow with a gun or a blue gun. Yeah, sure. Right? Like, Shooting, you know. With, how does this all relate to, I mean, concealed carrier or whatever? Like, oh, we got to we gotta take it back from jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how no, does it all relate? I'm bringing it right back into jiu-jitsu. Right, right. Ready? Exactly. How does it all relate, right? So it so. all relates. And, and, you know, I was listening to Greg's last episode of Endless Endeavor mm -hmm. the other day. And you hear someone else? Now? I think that was Brandon. Oh, you better keep, uh, it, down. That keep was it down over there. The episode two on like a, it was you had a new gun owner on. And you were going One of your black belts, right? Yep. Okay. And um, I've said this for years. I teach uh, I teach pistol courses to civilians and I teach an entangled gunfighting course, basically that is de dealing with what what's called contact or point blank distance range meaning contact where we can hug each other point blank we can shake hands or punch each other right and i'll sit down with a group of of guys in a room and they're all you know wearing their you know let god sort them out t-shirts and you know till valhalla and all these <laughs> badass t-shirts and molly backpacks and pouches and you name it skull and um chest you know really looking tough dude and the the thing is is if i tried to rob them within arm's reach and they try to pull a gun out i'm going to take that gun from them and i'm going to beat them to death with it and i'm not <laughs> i'm not even trying to bolster and you know he can do the same thing even on another level he can do the same thing on another level and people get a gun and they think that gun solves all the problems and they think oh well if i can shoot a gun it's going to fix everything and that couldn't be further from the truth you know i have something called the being the complete combatant and being a complete combatant is uh not just your firearm skills but your your uh physical fitness and your 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 hand skills your combative skills your situational awareness skills you know your your medical and trauma skills etc cetera, etc cetera. There's a whole thing that goes into it. So people get a gun and they start packing heat and they think that's the solution for every problem. So that's how it relates. So go train jujitsu. So go train. But then you learn jujitsu, right? Yeah, and then one day you learn jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, and jujitsu is a superpower. It right. really is. And it I, I, I see this way, man, because I'm a civilian and never been into the military, never been a cop. And uh, I'm from Brazil, which is a place where you cannot have a gun. Uh, and then end up here in America, right? Living the dream. I never thought jiu-jitsu as the uh, travel the world, this and that. I never thought, man, because uh, it didn't exist that in my time, you know? I used to see the surfers. And I'm like, bro, I want to go around the world. I want to, you know, like, and how, you know? And then jujitsu start happening, right? Jujitsu start like opening. Uh, the when 2007 the, the first world championship became uh, in American soil, right? It came to to California, and I came here and I was wow! I saw the the whole American dream could be happening, you yeah. know. And of course, I didn't I, I didn't come to stay. I came I came here to 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 fight. Then I. I, I, I stay back and forth for a while to to have opportunity to have a job here to to stay and everything and then i saw that i could have the the type of visa i had i could have a gun you know so i was like wow why not you know if i can let's 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 see and um and i was because of jujitsu i was being around like cops and military people right that's because i in my opinion the, the best cops train jujitsu 
you know what I mean? Like the best military people knows jujitsu, right? And um, and I have opportunity to go to to go overseas a few times with the uh, the military, teaching troops overseas. I went all over Pacific, all over uh, Middle East. I went to Afghanistan, and I had like some really nice experience. And um, one thing I can tell you is like, you can shoot forever, right? I and mean, one time you 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 you're gonna run out of of ammo, all right? But it doesn't happen with jujitsu. Jujitsu is on you, right? If you need 24 hours working for you, it's just switch the the, the it's just turn the switch and you and you're ready for war, you know. And I think that's where where it, it comes together, you know. I mean, because as as a fighter, I mean, you of course you you're in a war zone, you have to shoot and stuff. But like like Greg said, sometimes it happens too fast, it's too close, and you have no no training for that. Right. You know what I mean? You gotta come from from your from your for from your skills, right? And that's when jujitsu kicks in, you know. And you 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 and you end up on top. You end up, you know, choking someone. You end up winning a situation, you know. And that's I think where it, it comes together with with the, the whole military, the whole gun, the consuming thing with, with the fight, you know, about being a fighter. So at the end of the day, I think is uh, is that's that's the way, you know. Like I think the best guy is gonna gonna always do, you know. Yeah. Like uh, I I was even talking to a friend the other day, which is uh you know you remember Pete, Pete Sarconi? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Bro, he's like high, he's a like big you know, on the LAPD. You know, he's my he's my student. He's a black belt under John Jack John Jacks Machado, and he was telling me he's like, man, the cops need Greg need Greg back that's yeah. like one guy they cannot lose you know what yeah. I mean like <laughs> like guy with those skills with that with that mentality bro you you need them you know you need people like that you need like fighters like on the on the whole uh sense of the word you know what I mean yeah, not yeah. just a, a guy with a gun with authority with the uh, reinforcing the law you know but no, a guy of, exactly a guy who's who has the the other the the you no know, the morals and and the ethics and the work ethics and and put together so it's a guy who doesn't need a gun to to be tough it's a guy who doesn't need a gun to to fix a problem or to end up an altercation or a fight you know what i mean it's a guy who don't you don't gonna see on the on the tv choking someone to death you know what i mean so it it, it comes along you know what i mean i think at the end of the day a fighter like greg just says like a complete fighter you know you, you have to to handle yourself you have to to cover your own uh ass you know the whole time so i think that's when things come together we I got a we got a question got okay. a question thoughts on krav maga i've never trained krav maga so i mean i can't really give much of a like factually based opinion about krav maga the only thing that i'll say <laughs> is this because a lot of i've had co-workers that have trained krav maga and they told me that they never they don't spar at a at like no. a real like a real level a realistic they pull they pull 100%, and they, 100%. 100%. They, don't they, go 100%. Pull, they pull and they I, 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 yeah, I, yeah and so i mean i always tell people this in my personal opinion and maybe i'm biased because i love jiu-jitsu and, and i own a jiu-jitsu academy but jiu-jitsu muay thai wrestling western boxing the arts to where when you're training it's simulating a real fight it feels real and it is real. I've had my nose broken more times than I can count in training. And so that gives you instant realistic feedback of what works, what doesn't work, where you're safe, where you're in danger. And the reality of training where you don't get that realistic feedback is sure, you may you may be able to throw a punch or you may be able to kick a bag. But what happens when your head gets bounced off the ground and, and blood's rushing out of your nose? I can tell you what's going to happen. That panic's going to set in. Right. And realistic hard training. Uh, one of the biggest parts that you gain you gain from training is you can be calm when you're getting your ass kicked. And I know that sounds weird, but you can have a guy on top of you mounting you who's better than you. So you get that fight or flight response kicking in, right? But you can't get away from the guy and you can't beat him in a fight. So now what? And if you don't learn how to handle yourself when you're facing those emotions in a training environment, good luck being able to contain those emotions in some dark alley when you're calling for backup and your radio battery just popped out and now you're fucked. And so, and I'm not here to talk 
like shit on any of the other arts. Like if you're a Krav Maga guy or you're a Taekwondo guy, all that stuff is training and it's good. And I encourage people to do that. But I would say if you're part of an art where you're not getting any type of real sparring, go to somewhere where you can get that and then apply your art in a full contact state and kind of see where it goes, see what works and what doesn't work. Cause then you're going to get more realistic feedback. Yeah. Agreed a hundred percent. Yeah. I did Krav Maga for like six months before I moved to the North shore. Mm -hmm. It was fun. It was a good workout. It wasn't what yeah. walking into Vita was like, like you said, you can go hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason the best fighters in the world don't train Krav Maga and they train, you know, boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, jujitsu. You know, even if you want to look at it from a from a um, a sport, you know, mixed martial arts uh, standpoint, which they're still they're fantastic fighters. Yes, they're doing it in a cage with somewhat of a rule set, but guess what? Those fighters can still on the street gouge your eye out or bite you or smash your head in with a brick and they can do it better than you can <laughs> right so there's a reason the best fighters in the world they train brazilian jiu-jitsu they are are you know wrestlers um they train boxing and and kickboxing or muay thai you know and you know what else all those guys do is they maintain an elite level of fitness yeah. and that's something that i mean if you think you're a gunfighter since we're, we're gonna take it back to guns yeah. right and away from jujitsu if you think you're a gunfighter and you don't have an elite level of fitness you're doing yourself a disservice because it's exactly what greg said a fight is a fight and the range of that fight is going to determine what tool we use so don't think of it as a gunfight versus a grappling fight think of it as a fight and i tell new shooters that all the time because i talked about it on my last podcast you give a new shooter a gun a lot of times they'll they'll stand up all straight and they'll they'll kind of pull their head back and, and and just get this real weird stance and you just push them and they're going to fall over because everything that they're doing is like they're putting themselves in the least athletic position as possible and some of these guys are wrestlers and fighters guys that i've trained with and i'll take them shooting and you see them start to do that and then i'll be like dude how would you stand if you were about to shoot a double on someone and then they get a good base, yeah. they get good foot placement, they kind of, you know, they, they find their base. I say, now hold the pistol like that. And it instantly changes their perception of what a gunfighting stance is. Because in a gunfight, what do you need to be able to do? You need to be able to duck, you need to be able to cut an angle and sprint, you need to be able to jump, you need to be able to strike someone, you need to be able to do all the same things that you need to do in a fight, except you just have a gun in your hand. So for those of you guys that are listening that like, you're primarily a sh like a sports shooter or you enjoy like firearms as a hobby. If you're carrying a gun, it like it's almost an obligation to maintain some type of fitness because if you don't have that fitness and you get in a gunfight, there's a good chance someone's just going to take it out of your hands and, and beat you to death with it. A lot of people carry and they do not have any personal fitness whatsoever. And that, that, that comes up a lot. Luke, you and I have talked about this where people will, you know, uh, put yourself in the scenario of you, you have to draw a gun on somebody, but that person just tries to grab it. What do you do? What are you going to do? If you're not prepared for something like that, now you're fighting over this gun. And if that person wins, now you're in all sorts of trouble. Right. Yeah. We, y'all were talking about that in the back of the gym, yep. like literally a couple hours ago. I, um, so I teach, I teach a one day home defense course for civilians open enrollment. And it's just basic one man CQB. You find yourself in the worst situation you could ever find yourself in. Let's give you a little couple little tips and tactics that you can utilize. And uh, this past weekend, I had a, uh, a gentleman, 58 years old, and took quite a few shooting courses, knew how to shoot, knew how to handle a gun pretty well, very out of shape, very overweight. And he knew that. And we started talking about this very topic right here. And he goes, man, I just, I've, I've kind of just, I've, I've relished re relinquished to the fact that if I came up against someone like you, he's like, I'd never win. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm that's where I'm at in my life. I said, no, nah, that's bullshit. That's a bullshit excuse. I have a 58 year old in my gym. Who's a blue belt in my gym. 
He's 58 years old, and the dude is an absolute monster of a blue belt. The dude is a monster. He beats up guys. He beats up these kids, same rank, that are a third his age. And so I asked the gentleman this weekend, I said, well, it takes some time for you to get in shape. Huh? He goes, yeah, I'm just, it takes too much time. I'm not in shape. I said, well, it takes some time for you to get good at jujitsu. And he goes, yeah, I mean, it would take a lot of time. I said, let me ask you that. You said you're overweight. You said you're fat and out of shape now, right? He goes, yeah. I said, did that happen overnight? And I got kind of a blank stare. I said, it took some time to get there, huh? Mm -hmm. It took months and years of eating poorly and not exercising enough for you to become there, right? Well, guess what? It can go the other way. Mm -hmm. And the, the time is now. Start now. Get in the yeah. gym. I don't care if you're overweight. I don't care if you get winded during warmups and you got to sit around out because every day you get better. And the, and the reality of it is, this sounds almost kind of cliche to say, but you don't need to be chasing a world championship or some Olympic level fitness. You need to just be a better version of yourself. And as long as you can continue to do that, I mean, that was George St. Pierre's thing. He's like, my only goal is to be a better, better martial artist tomorrow than I am today. Yep. That's it. And apply that. And if day. you apply that to your health and your nutrition, it's like, yeah, it might, it might be very small baby steps, but eventually you're going to get to where you want to be. I don't even think that takes that much <clears throat> because, bro, I, I teach people, right, that never trained before. And, like, when they train, like, normally, like, three times a week, they start, like, they, they start, like, feeling jiu-jitsu. They start liking jiu-jitsu, start going, right? But they, they're, they're not pros. They're, they have their lives. They're, they try to do a little, little better diet here and there and stuff. But, bro, three months, they're beating up anyone that comes new to the gym. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It takes three months of okay training to become a – Two steps ahead of the better the than 90% of the people exactly. out there. Yeah, it yeah. Takes three months, bro. One year. And I'm not talking about like lifting and dieting like a crazy. Just being a normal, cool guy. That three hours a week. Three dollars a week. Bro, you <laughs> go there, have fun, ask ask questions about, you know, like things about jiu-jitsu, this and that. And that just adds to your life. You know what I mean? Like, in serious, bro, don't take like more than three months to 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 step over the head, the, 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 the rest of the pack, yeah. you know, it's like one year you just change your life, like forever, bro. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, it, at, if you don't get into jujitsu, at least you learn what, what it takes. You know what I mean? So you, 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 you you're going to step, you, you're not stepping into fights because you know what's up. You, you know understand. What I mean? So you're yeah. saving your ass just by knowing what it takes. You know what I mean? And if you, if you keep going, Bro, eventually you, you become very good without much intention. You know, you don't have to be like, no, man, I'm going to be the next Van Damme. No, you don't have to. You just go there, have fun, you know, like new friends, Zach, big new friends, get a new habit of going to the gym and, you know, training and learning things you didn't know before. A uh, couple weeks, a few weeks later, you're already moving much better than you did your whole life. Right. Yep. And in a few months, you're already fighting guys that would beat you up in other eyes. You know right. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think they, I think is you don't have you don't even have to take that serious because the thing jujitsu really works. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. yeah. It's life changing. Exactly. It's a superpower. And, so, and something this? else I'd like to just kind of piggyback off Go of ahead. that is like Joao said, you you don't have to be at the gym lifting weights and you don't have to be at the track running sprints. But I get I'm sure all you guys get new people all the time. It's like, man, I, I want to try jujitsu, but I want to get in shape first. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Yeah. And oh, I, we, I've had several, several members of mine that said it. And I looked at them like, I'm like, so you're going to send your kid to the fourth grade next year. Right. Yeah. Right. Little, little Bobby over there. Um, no, you shouldn't send him to fourth grade. You got to get him smarter before he go to the fourth grade. And then they look at me like this. I said, See, that sounds pretty fucking stupid, doesn't it? <laughs> I said, this is fitness. Yeah, you're, it is. Every right. time you're on the mat, you're getting fitter. Yep. And and that that alone, training jiu-jitsu and doing nothing else, is going to improve your strength and your cardiovascular fitness. And then also your technique comes with that. So that's why like, that's why a lot of people, once they start training jiu-jitsu, they get hooked. Because it's like all-encompassing in one art. It's addictive. So. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to take a swing at Jessica's question well, for real one quick. real quick. I was what? 38 when I started 39, I'm 41 now. So is this yeah. two or three? How long have y'all been 
open? Uh, we so two been years. Open a little over two years. Yeah. So I started when I was 39. Yeah. So Jessica, so and I was wife, out of shape. You were very out of shape. Greg has a picture that he really likes to show. Yeah, the yeah, first you're a class. Fat you, little pig. Yeah, dude. Before and after. <laughs> Man, you guys did that, bro. You like did that? Fat, oh, dude, I did it, bro. <laughs> yeah. I, will say, nice. <laughs> the I won't say what Jeremy called me. But. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> pull it up, but it was hilarious. And before you answer, Jessica, I'm also 39, and I don't feel like. Are you I elderly? fall into the elderly. <laughs> One more year, though. <laughs> quite One more year, yet. 40, yeah. right? Yeah, no, I mean, I have, a, I have a new white a belt. Months. I have a new white belt that's 63 years yeah, you've old. Got, yeah, we've got yeah. a few older My, my guys. boy, Ed. He's my favorite, yeah, too. He's, 60, he's 63 years old. Dude, white belt. He's about to get his second stripe. Mm -hmm. And uh, if Ed, if you're watching this, right, you got to show me a few things, bro. I told you about. And he's going to get that second. But, dude, he's in there. Yep. And you know what? He's in there for him. Yeah. He's not like every day, like, oh, uh, he comes in twice a week, three times a week, loves it, trains hard, does a good job learning, you know? And, and I, I always tell people this that are, they ask like, is, um, am I too old to train or, or this hurts or that hurts? And I'm, I, I injured my neck when I was younger. This is the reality of jujitsu. When you train jujitsu, you're going to get banged up. You're going to have injuries. Sometimes you're going to get hurt, but you have to train in a manner that works for you and your body and like training at a, at a, at a pace that maybe you're nursing a, a bad knee or whatever, you're still going to get better training than sitting on your couch saying, I can't train because I got a bad knee. Yeah. And it, a lot of people are reluctant to train because of this or because of that. And at the end of the day, you just have to, you have to work with what you have, you know? And I mean, some people that might even just be walking just depending on their body and, and their ailments and whatnot. Right. We're getting questions like, what about people in wheelchairs or elderly or disabled? I mean. All right. Yeah. So if you can't um, oh, go ahead. Well, no, I got a buddy who's a triple amputee. Both legs amputated above the knee. He's missing his right arm. And he's a purple belt. And he's on the mat every day. That one hand kills you. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the dude, the, dude the, the guy's a monster. His one arm. I wonder how that one arm, arm, that one hand. His <laughs> neck and head pressure. It might be the sky guy's road. a monster. Seriously. And you know what? That's that's his thing. And the dude's an awesome dude. And, you know, Jessica going, you know, 39, um, you feel sort of dumb to just go in. Yeah, you know what? You're going to feel a little dumb. You're going to be intimidated. You're going to be scared. And you know what? That's good. Because adults don't do that shit anymore. Adults don't get out of their comfort zone anymore, right? We get comfortable in our career, in our lives, in our homes, in our friends, in our family. And we don't feel that fear that the, the butterflies in our stomach of the first day of kindergarten. My wife who was never, ever interested in any of this stuff. She's four foot 11. She's a tiny little thing. And she never had any interest in jujitsu for all the years that I did it. We opened up the academy and said, well, if we're going to do this, I need to at least give it an honest try. She trains like almost every single day. She just got her blue belt and she is taking new guys in the gym that come in. And we're talking like full grown 180, 190 pound six foot men and is able to sweep them and flip them over and hold them down. And you see this grown man struggling to get out from my little tiny four foot 11 wife. But she also, you all, we all started, every one of us started in the same place. So this also, is, also, if she was fighting someone who doesn't train, she would be killing those dudes, oh, right? Yeah. Exactly. Like that's how powerful thing get. I always tell people like, because yeah, if you come to practice, and I have some female athletes that I do pair up with people that are new, because I think that's a pretty powerful lesson. And I'm I'm not trying to shit on their ego or or like take away from their manhood, but when you get beat up by a 21 year old girl as a 45 year old man. That's kind of a check, a reality check. What sold me? But I always tell people. <laughs> I always tell. There you go. I always tell people this. There's a camera. <laughs> it's not right there. <laughs> if, if what you're looking for is an art that really works, then the fact that this 21 year old girl question. can kick your ass, that proves what we're doing here is real. Right. If you came in off the streets and didn't know jujitsu and were able to handle people in the gym. That have been training for two, three, four years. What would be the point of training jujitsu? You know, mm -hmm. 
So I know you skipped that last question. But Which I one? That for a reason. I was brought here, Scott. I want I want I want to address your question too cuz Scott's oh, did got a he really put one up? Question. Yeah. But this this question right here I was invited here tonight with the assumption this was a concealed carry info podcast is starting to sound like an infomercial for gym memberships. Um Man, how do I how do I go into this without completely offending you, Kevin? <laughs> you're not to like toot our own horns, but you're looking at a group of guys that have spent a a, a lifetime, a career over two decades individually in in self-defense uh military special operations law enforcement special special operations guys who have really really been in fights for real and i'm not talking about uh a schoolyard fight when you were in sixth grade i'm not talking about the barroom fight you know when you were a teenager i'm talking about fighting legitimate um opponents legitimate bad guys legitimate terrorists right and Part of concealed carry is the total package of being able to apply and implement that weapon, which specifically for concealed carry is a pistol in a fight for your life responsibly to not hurt other people. And a big, big part of that, look, and I'm speaking to you, not as I'm not trying to sell you a gym membership. All right. I don't think you probably even live in my area. I can direct you to a good gym if you would like to, though. But I can tell you from having been in real gunfights, all right, I can tell you for having to fight for my life with a guy who pulled a gun on me and we fought over the gun. And the only thing that I believe this day that saved my life was I had jujitsu, all right? Um, you got to have the total package if you're going to carry a gun. If you're going to carry a gun and and potentially use that, in a life or death situation, you cannot be grossly out of shape. You cannot only rely on marksmanship skills that you gain once a month at your indoor range shooting a paper target. It's a whole package. And if you don't realize that, you don't understand that, you don't seek that out and to better yourself daily, um, in my opinion, you're being grossly negligent. I think, I think if you look behind the guys here, you can see like 20 guns. And, the, and these guys own these, own these guns. And they are telling you that only those guns don't gonna help you. They're gonna save your life. It might create you, it might even give you a problem if you if somebody take the gun from you. You know what I mean? It, it might use against you, you know? So, um, yeah, man, I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a whole training, you know? It's a whole training. It's like cops, you know what I mean? Cops cannot just shoot. Right. They have to learn how to fight. They have to learn a little bit of uh, trying to understand, you know, like the, the psychology of people and try to escalate things and don't create gunfights <laughs> everywhere they go, you know what I mean? So uh, it's it's the whole thing together, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not like just jujitsu or just the gun or just eating right or just lifting, you know? It's I think it's, it's, it's the whole combination of factors that put you in a comfort zone, you know what I mean? Put yeah. you on a safe zone, you right. know? Uh, you have to train. You have to to learn things. You have to 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 not just rely buy a gun and re and ammo and think that oh, no, I'm I'm good now. You know what I mean? Like ammo doesn't gonna you know last forever. Anyways, you know. So you have to to cover yourself. You know. So <clears throat> and I think like yeah, we're preaching fitness and jujitsu and fighting, but not only for the fact that you have you may find yourself in a situation where you have to apply that. But I can tell you from experience, and I'm not too embarrassed to say this, your fitness in a gunfight isn't only for sprinting to cover or carrying your buddy downstairs. Like, and it depends. There's different situations. I've been in engagements where a dude popped up from behind a building and boom, you're in a gunfight. But I've also been in situations where you see a guy, he ducks behind a wall and you're, you're trying to get a, you're trying to see where he's going. And then you see that now he's behind a car and he's a little closer. Well, how the fuck did he get to that car? Like, and I can tell you the adrenaline dump when a guy is maneuvering on you, even, and, and I'm aware of this and I'm watching this and I have an AR 10. This was in Ramadi, Iraq. These dudes are doing the same thing that we're doing and it gets real, real, real fast. And I don't care. I was with a bunch of Delta dudes and Rangers and Navy SEALs and the amount of adrenaline it was, I was actually embarrassed because I was trying to get a sight picture on the guy 
yeah. and my fu- I was trembling. And you know, like when your arms are shaking just a little, your your yeah. fucking object is little, dancing around yeah. just like this, right? Yeah. And that's an Army Ranger deployed to Iraq with special operations. Yeah. If you think that you're going to be at the mall and an active shooter is going to fucking start shooting people in the in the back of the Target store, and you're just going to pull your gun and you're going to go and maneuver on this guy, and it's all good, you're kidding yourself. It's fucking the biggest adrenaline dump. You're breathing hard. Your heart rate spikes. And fitness, maintaining fitness, helps pull 100%. that back. 100%. Even if it's this much. 100%. You know? and <clears throat> Kevin, I- I'm, glad you, I'm glad you commented back because I don't honestly, and, and I, I can speak, I think, for Greg and Joao that we don't expect any of our audience ever that we're speaking to, to reach our levels, right? Uh, this is something that we've dedicated our life to. Um, and yes, we, we maybe take it to the next level and we're extremely passionate about it. But one of the reasons we're so passionate about it is because we know from seeing it, what it can do for you guys. Joao already spoke three months of jujitsu and, and that's three days a week. So that's one hour class, three days a week. Guys in his gym are just annihilating and training brand new people that walk in, you know? So if, if you go to an anytime fitness or some 24 hour fitness, you know, three days a week and, and walk on the treadmill, use that time at a jujitsu gym instead, get that exercise and start training because you know what? You're going to meet other concealed carry enthusiasts. You're going to meet law enforcement officers. You're going to meet military guys. A lot of guys in my gym, heck, tomorrow we're not training jujitsu. Right. We're going shooting. We're going to the range tomorrow. And we're going shooting. Right. And then Saturday we'll be in the gym training jujitsu. So we don't expect you to ever reach our, our level. You know, obviously some of the young kids that, that we're pushing are, but it's never too late. You know, going back to the 63 year old student that Greg has, a 63 year old student that I have, they started this at those ages. And Again, Greg said, be a better version of yourself. Be a complete combatant, right? Don't just rely on the gun. So, man, you can, you don't have to be me. You don't have to be these guys, but you can be better tomorrow than you are today. And you can be better the next day than you are tomorrow. Um, it's, and it will change your life. I promise you, you'll come back and you'll send us a message in three months going, man, Greg, I'm sorry for that first comment, dude. You are right. <laughs> you know you know what I've been seeing lately, bro. It's like uh, because of this uh, George Floyd thing, and then people saying like, well, "How are you going to stop people to 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 killing?" Right? And bro, nine nine percent of the people saying like, "Wow, cops should train jujitsu." You know what I mean? I haven't seen people saying like, "No, no, cops should shoot more or shoot extra or get better guns or this or that." I just see like 99% of the people say like, no, cops should train jujitsu right. in a normally normal basis, you know, like have their, 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 their skills test once a year. You know what I mean? I heard cops only have to shoot 60 rounds to, to, to be a co-op every year or something like that. It's, yeah. yeah it's, depending it's, either once a year or twice a year, depending on the ridiculous, state. bro. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like, it's less than take a, it's less than be a blue belt. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. So uh, I think like, the whole world is talking about this now, and I think the the what makes more sense on, on people's words and it's yes, cops should be training jujitsu and not like martial arts, karate, taekwondo. No, jujitsu because yeah. karate, martial uh, taekwondo, you don't learn the hundred percent that takes to to stop someone or, or get stopped, right? Because when you learn, once you once you you become a you you're a little more a little better. On, on on doing those things even shooting right uh it takes you know and you you, you become a better person you know you be even not just the, the part of holding people and and securing them but also escalating the situation right because yeah. now you're not breaking people you don't need like six guys to put one person down you, yeah. one guy maybe two yeah. fix the problem without much uh, violence you know what i mean that's or injury to them. exactly so like I think it's I think it's it's obvious, you know, yeah. like uh, the the way things are going, you know, and that's why we're we're talking so much about jujitsu, because we, we I think we we know the magic, we see the magic happening every day, changing people's uh, lives, you know. So I think it's it, it's 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 not 
I mean, we're not trying to to sell memberships, right? Yeah. We're trying to, to to give a solution. Stop complaining and come up with solutions for yeah. for people that carry guns, for cops that cops that need more training. You know, uh, holding people and stopping people without killing them or shooting them. And I think that all goes towards that way. You know? And you know what else is a big part of training for police officers? Not only how to apply it, how to hold someone down. Because when people think of cops training jujitsu, they think of, okay, he's going to be able to choke this guy or he's going to be able to mount this guy. But the other side of the coin is I know what it's like for him to have his knee on my face. And that's an important lesson. I know what bad positions feel right, like. Yeah. And I know from personal experience that I don't want to have, I don't want to be underneath someone's knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Right. And so not only do you know how to apply it, but you know where it's at from the other side of it, the receiving yeah. end, where is dangerous. You can responsibly and apply it. Exactly. Um, can you see Scott's? question what should you look for in picking a class or an instructor, instructor or so, a gym or something that i always tell people and i'll let joao go off on this because he's a much higher level instructor than, than i am but one of the most important things that i think you need to find with an instructor is somebody that you just mesh with somebody that you just when you meet them and you talk with them you realize like I feel comfortable around this person. I got to, I get a good vibe off this person. The jujitsu is going to come, right? But you want to have that immediate vibe with that person. And when people come into my academy, I tell them I have, I have no contracts. I have no cancellation fees. And I even encourage you to check out the other gyms yep. in the area Same here. Mm -hmm. because I want Sounds a team. Like <laughs> I want a team of guys that want to bear, to share these mats with me and my guys. Yep. And the only way that you're really going to know that this place is for you is to go do your homework, read up on the different academies, go meet the different guys, shake their hands, talk to them about their program, talk to them about like the financial aspects, all the things that are important to you, and then take all that information. It might be two, three, four gyms and go home and, and see what works for your, your family, your schedule and, and your needs. And I think that's the most responsible way to go about it. Find a place that you like being at. Otherwise, trust me, jujitsu is hard enough. Around. You're not gonna want to. You're not gonna go. I, I, I agree. <laughs> uh, vibes, vibes speaks louder. When yeah. it's time to find a place to, 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 to stay. You know what I mean? To, to, to invest your money, your time. You know, like it, it really about the vibe. Mm -hmm. If you feel like, like Greg just said, like uh, comfortable around the person, around that, around that, that, that group of people, right? Because you, you're gonna be on a, on a group class um find find out what they, they offer you know see what what if they offer what your level needs you know like if they have a good white belts programs how they treat the white belts you know and and experience yourself sorry about that <laughs> whoops I thought you were tech guys. Yeah. Yeah. On. It just like literally reset. That's something I would it do. Reset it reset. It just, that's what I say about <laughs> computers. But it, it just, just, Greg touched it. <laughs> Greg looked at my iPad. And <laughs> there was a question from somebody that I wanted to post. Can, can I put one up real quick? Yeah, go ahead. I go ahead. You guys want to touch on this. I mean, we, we have two people here with uh, uh, experience and. Uh, go ahead. You can reset it. Well, Melissa has asked this qu uh, question twice, and I, I don't know, like I said, if you guys want to touch on it, but um, about the uh, police department spanning the use of chokeholds, um, which some have already done, and then she's talking about New York's new law of not being able to put body weight on the diaphragm, and I'm and I'm wondering what uh, you know from a from a law enforcement perspective, having that experience, um, is is that a is that a big deal when when something like that is is taken away or there or you're just like no big deal there are other ways to handle somebody that we're trying to it's it's control. such a big deal that my, my department that i formerly worked for they just banned chokeholds and it's such a big deal to me that i would have quit over that if i still worked for them and this is why yes george floyd was murdered by a police officer i think most cops would agree what we saw there was atrocious and it was outside of policy and it was unreasonable and the guy's in jail because of it. And he's probably going to get charged or found guilty of murder mm -hmm. because that happened. 
That has nothing to do with banning LVNRs or rear naked chokes or whatever you want to call them on the streets. And I'll tell you why. Because when applied properly, an LVNR or rear naked choke is one of the fastest ways to control a violent subject and with little to no injury. Mm -hmm. And so you put a guy out, you put him in cuffs, then you see that you get him in the recovery position or you put him in the back of your patrol car and everybody goes home and everybody's safe, including the suspect and everybody's free of injury. You start to take away tools like that. Well, what's our next option? Okay. What are you going to do now? If you can't use jujitsu when somebody's attacking you, well, am I going to go to my taser? Am I going to go to my baton? Like, what are my options here? Do you want me to break this guy's jaw? You want me to just punch him in the face as hard as I can? Like, I don't hear, I don't hear departments talking about banning strikes to the face, but they're banning the choke. And I would ask anybody that's listening right now, would you rather a stand there and get punched in the face by me as hard as you could, or B allow me to put you to sleep with a chokehold, And then the exercise is complete. Which one do you choose? And mm. I say the same thing to like, because these, <laughs> these knee jerk reactions aren't coming down from anyone within the law enforcement community. It's, it's or political with any training yeah, or with any training. It's political pressure that's coming down from mayors and city council members that have never been in a fight that don't have any jujitsu experience, that don't know how to shoot a gun. And I can tell you from experience, by taking away the tools that are down here, you're going to make a higher likelihood that people are going to go and escalate faster. By taking away jujitsu from police officers, you're going to see more people get shot. More excessive and, uses of yep, force. Sure. You know, That's how I see it too, man. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I also, uh, the way I see it, I think like these, like the law they're going to, change the, the 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 fight right you know yeah. what i mean the, the law because now you can do this you can do that the law don't gonna change the fight if you have to choke someone to save your skin you will choke the and problems gonna happen anyways you know what i mean uh i believe training would be the right the key you know and more I mean? training like, exactly. not taking so, away so more right. chokes would happen less people would die less gun fights would happen and that world would be the better place you know what i mean but training you know specific training for cops you know what i mean uh with focus on on the on holding people even choking people because you have to learn like like greg just says like bro you have you have to understand the both points you know what i mean if you know how much hurts you don't gonna do that way because you know and then at the end of the day you're a, you're a father of family you're a, you want to come back home you don't want to go from that fight to the jail because you just kill a guy, you know what I mean? Because you didn't have training enough, you know what I mean? I'm pretty sure those guys who kill suspects choking, they, they don't train jiu-jitsu, no. you know what I mean? I'm pretty sure they don't train jiu-jitsu because if they do, they would do different, you know what I mean? Like you clearly can see when the guy knows what he's doing, how smooth things just happen, how easy it looks like, right? right? And those dudes who doesn't know, things just look harder because they are and things escalate to the point where there's no comeback you know there's no return point and so. you know greg mentioned the lvnr and it's the lateral vascular neck restraint right mm -hmm. so what's that look, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, own <laughs> rear naked yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> right <laughs> so i'll say this you know when we're in the gym training we're, we're training extremely hard um and if I get caught in any sort of joint submission, an arm bar, knee bar, you know, anything that's uh, affecting one of my limbs or joints, man, I'm tapping fast and in a hurry as quick as I can. Right. But the chokes are so safe that literally that's the one thing that I will fight and fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. And fight. I got put out twice the other day, like out coming back, you know, cause like, I know, like I'll go to sleep for a second, I come back up and I'm fine and I'll go another round. I'm ready to go like right away. Because if you know how to do it, you know how to apply it, you know how to release it and it's it's really safe, you know, but like and, Greg said, you know, ignorant people are 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 making these these demands and these changes. And a big thing that I don't think people think about is being highly trained at, at all aspects of policing with your firearm, with your less than lethal tools and with just hand to hand combat, you start to find yourself de-escalating more often than you're escalating 
because you put off the vibe to people. And, and I, I was always respectful of people when I was on patrol, even shitheads. Like, I'm here to be cool to you until you give me a reason not to be, right? But if you're confident in who you are and your abilities and you know if this goes sideways, okay, I'll be able to handle myself. You're win. Yeah. If you believe That's that you in said. your heart, right? then the interaction leading up to that point can be completely kind and respectful. And I've had dudes that are like, I had one guy, he was all methed out. And he was tweaking, but his ears looked worse than mine. So I, I knew right away, okay, this, this dude's, yeah. And <laughs> he started doing this kind of stuff, like all, like poster child for pre-fight, pre-assault indicators, yeah. right? And so I just said, I said, hey, bro, look, it looks like you're getting ready to throw down. If you want to fight, I'll fucking fight you right now. I enjoy fighting as much as you do. I can tell by your ears, right? So I'm down to scrap if that's where you want to take this. Or we can just be cool to each other, too. I'm not even here to get you in trouble. It was a criminal trespassing. Yeah. I was just going to get him out of there. Right. right. I said, so if you're cool with me, I'm cool with you. Or if you want to fucking throw down and beat the fuck out of each other, we can go that route too. I'm leaving it up to you. And he's like, man, I've never had a cop just shoot me straight like that, bro. That's fucking cool, man. You're cool. And I was like, <laughs> well, I'm not cool, but I'm just telling you like, we can be cool or we can fucking fight. Right. And if you're confident in that, and my partner was like, yeah. you know, he didn't want any of this guy. And it's just having the confidence to just, shoot people straight you know where you stand you know where they stand and he ended up he was a collegiate wrestler so i because i started talking to him afterwards and being cool with him right and i was like yeah that dude would fucking maul every other cop in my department yep right and so how would if you approach that guy like a dick for no reason then it's on it's on and he's probably gonna double leg you and dump you on your head on the concrete yep or because you're confident in who you are and what you bring to the table you can use that to actually de-escalate and prevent yeah. shit from happening 100%. in the first place. Right. He also might take you down with your choke. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, he's yeah, going to yeah. give up his back because he's, he's a wrestler. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's going to give his back up. For sure you're that choking. Like, okay, That's what happened. It's okay. We have a bad jiu-jitsu <laughs> awesome. joking that dude on the guillotine. <laughs> That's what happened usually. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Straight up. <laughs> What are the prices for most classes? I've done wrestling and boxing, but would definitely be interested in more. Yeah, I mean, uh, prices, uh, junior banks, JR banks, it really depends on the area you live in. The You know, the different demographics are, you know, obviously have a different cost of living and whatnot. So it, that really depends. Best bet is find out the gyms that are close to where you live or on your commute to and from work and uh, go pay them a visit. Go find out. Yep. I think it'd be safe to say a hundred to two hundred dollars is probably. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I've seen. Yep. You know, of it. Dep- like in Southern California, you're probably two two hundred dollar yeah. range right. yeah. around that. Up where I'm at, outside of Seattle, most gyms are hundred to low hundred, like hundred twenty five. Yep. So we're right in the middle here. Like anything else, you would do, right? Like any membership of anything, no price, right? Yeah. Price. And out. and the other thing I'll say on that, like, what. In what industry on planet Earth is the cheapest usually the best? None. You know? <laughs> None. In this world, you get what you pay for. That's it. Exactly. These mic stands are working out pretty good. <laughs> are, they, are they shit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make sure this one falls off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to break it. All good. What do you got? You got other questions? This is oh, just back to what you were talking about before with um, with the policies being made about the, the chokeholds and whatnot. And Todd says it's just like gun control. People making decisions with little to no understanding slash expertise of the decisions that they're making. And that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's that's been going on since the beginning of time. Right. Like those type of that that type of operating, like got a lot of notoriety in vietnam because you had guys from washington telling guys in the jungle how to fight and it's no different now you got guys in suits sitting in offices telling officers that are patrolling the streets of new york what they can and what they can't do but for the i feel like this is the needle has moved even further now because this is the first time it's not it's no longer just a violation of policy they're saying there will be charges they will be charging them criminally yeah it's crazy you know i mean I don't see how any police officer that works in those those jurisdictions is even willing to go to work the next day. I mean, I get you got kids and you have a wife and you have your mortgage to pay, but if, if, if you're sitting in a cell because you mounted somebody 
you're not going to be able to pay those bills either. You know, what did you just put up there? I put, <laughs> I put it up there. I thought it was kind of funny. I think he's talking about just all the restrictions and, and, and after a while, they're going to be like, all right, no more, uh, you know, no more chokeholds, no more tasers, no more guns. Pacifiers, suckers, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Cases. I like it. Like, Man, hell like it's not a lollipop. It's just Fiends like lollipops. <laughs> it's funny though, because it's like all of these people that are saying defund the police and ban chokeholds and you can't do this and you can't do that. I would hope that in their heart, the whole reason that they're they're speaking up and saying these things is because they want to see less violence. They want to see less people get hurt. They want to see less people get killed. But what they don't understand is by implementing these ideas that they have is going to cause the absolute opposite yeah. reaction. Do you know violence? Do you know violence? Mm -hmm. I like that. So, you know, do you know violence? K N O W. Do right? No violence. You do no violence. N O violence. The most violent, the most capably violent people that I know are the nicest people and the least likely to get engaged in a serious uh, violent encounter. Well, and that brings up a good point that maybe people will appreciate hearing since it's not jujitsu. If you're carrying a concealed weapon, that saying applies. And if you're carrying a, a, a concealed weapon, the, the biggest thing that you should tr be looking for is avoiding a confrontation and de-escalating confrontations. Mm -hmm. That should be the... Like pulling that weapon out, and in my opinion, if you're pulling that weapon out, if you're breaking leather, it's, it's probably time to use it. Obviously, there's a million scenarios that you could paint where that may not be the case. But utilize a skill set to where you don't have to, you don't put yourself in a situation where you have to use that weapon. And that comes back to just awareness, having your head on the swivel, like all the things that I'm sure these guys talk about all the time. You maintain all those aspects of being tactical tactical and just understanding your battle space there's a good chance that you de-escalate or you prevent things from happening before they ever even occur yeah That's you had the yeah. story about the guy that broke into your house yeah gun pointed at him mm -hmm. shall we share could've that shot him shall we share that again I like if you that want story. i mean could have shot right. him so didn't. i heard that story for so many times yeah, yeah, still yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah they like didn't that. hear about this all right so, this i mean right? so and this is i was actually a blue belt when this occurred. and this is something like we would both cover in like a story on our website so it would be yeah, a breakdown. interesting Right. So I get uh, a breakdown. We'll, we're we're doing doing a breakdown. It right now. The girl I was living with at the time wakes me up and it was like two 30 in the morning or something. She's like, Greg, a guy's, a guy's breaking into the house. And I was like, okay, like, let's do this. And I had just redeployed home from a real bad deployment in Ramadi with a lot of violence and a lot of engagements. So as far as like where my head was at going and confronting somebody with violence, it, I was almost excited about it, you know? <laughs> And so, finally. yeah, finally, <laughs> let's go. So I, I came around the corner with my AR and I blasted him with my Surefire. He he lit him up with a white light. Just, and, so. and, and to this day, I don't understand. As soon as I did that, he's all, shoot me, motherfucker. Let's see you do it. I'm like, dude, he should be blinded. How does he How does he know I'm not just holding a flashlight in his face, you know? Mm -hmm. But he was telling me to shoot, shoot him and challenging me. And it became immediately apparent that the dude was, are we still on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It became immediately apparent that the dude was either real high or blacked out drunk or a combination of the two. And I thought, you know, I had that, like I said, I had my surefire light on him. I could tell he didn't appear to be armed. He appeared to be highly intoxicated and he didn't appear to be someone that I would have any type of difficulty restraining physically. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to kill this guy. And I, I probably could have. Right. I said, you know what? I'm just going to hand my weapon off. I told her to go call go back to her bedroom, call the police. And I used jujitsu and I had the guy unconscious in about 10 seconds for you guys that are jujitsu guys. I hit him with an arm drag into a rear naked. Nice. And then he was asleep in seven seconds, sat him down. I actually sat him down on the ground and sat behind him and put my hooks in. I didn't release the choke. I just loosened it so he could start breathing again. Like you said, when you're training, you're not going to hold a choke on someone for 10 right. minutes. And uh, the police came and they arrested him. And this is what ended up happening. The guy had rented a room from the house that I was living in five years earlier. 
and his ID still had my address on it. So he went out and got real fucked up somewhere and he gave a cab driver his driver's license and said, take me home. And his, he ended up coming into my house because he thought that was his home. Yeah. So a little dumb mistake while being blacked out drunk almost cost that dude his life. Yeah. But why didn't it? Because if you're competent you in your skills and you're able to analyze the situation and kind of like get big picture what's going on, I was able to say, you know what? I don't think, even though this guy's in my house, I don't think he's presenting a deadly threat. And I felt comfortable handling it with jujitsu. So, and I, and you know what? Like if I'd shot that dude, it would have, it would have sucked seeing how it all played out. The fact that he was just drunk and he was in the wrong house. It would not have been good, you know, but at the end of the day, it's on him. Mess. It's on him too. It, yeah. You know? hundred percent. But, but I don't want to do that to somebody. Having been through shootings in, in the U S uh -huh. they suck. Yeah. They suck. They try to ruin your life. They try to ruin your life, no matter how justified they are. And like, I'm talking like other guy with a gun shooting at you, empty casing, died with finger in the trigger sort of thing. Like very, very clear shootings. And uh, should have just let him kill you next I time. Know, just right? let him kill you. I know. And you don't have I mean, to deal no, with all the aftermath. Out way better. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, they try to ruin your life, even if you get after through the good shooting. And not only criminally, but then civilly. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, yeah right. you have all that aftermath after that after you've been cleared criminally. So, uh, yeah, let's not try to shoot people if we don't have to. I mean, don't if you can carry if you're a concealed carrier, you know, if someone is stealing a pair of shorts and socks out of Walmart, that's yeah, none of your business, really. You know, oh. like. What, like the ones we covered last yeah, week. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, let it go. Be a good witness. <laughs> Tell theft pre prevention or yep. call 911. Be a good witness, but even, don't even, get involved. At least for my department, even as a commissioned police officer, if I'm not on duty, our policy is if you observe a crime, you do not get involved unless somebody's at risk of death or serious bodily injury. 100%. So if you see someone stealing a car, if you see someone, like you said, grabbing shit out of a store, even as a police officer, Hey, let the people that are on duty in that jurisdiction um, handle that. Yep. Because what's going to happen is if you think you're a cop 24 seven, you start fucking interjecting yourself into things when you have your kids with you and you're at Starbucks, it's just a recipe for disaster. So, and if you're carrying concealed, that same policy should apply. That's my policy. When I'm carrying concealed, I'm not going to interject myself unless I feel that I am in fe like fear for my life or the lives of others or serious bodily injury yeah. outside of that. The weapon stays holstered and it's 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 a non-issue yep 100 percent. let's let's talk about a recent uh thing that happened really really quickly it's on the same topic and it's a it's a little extreme example but um of what to do what not to do when you're when you're carrying a gun and again extreme example but this guy uh, luke you know about this i don't know if anyone else uh the mask thing about this yeah the guy without talk about mask. so Basically, it was it was in a Walmart in uh, Miami, Florida area, and this guy that's not wearing a mask, he's he's pushing a, an older gentleman in a wheelchair, and doesn't have a mask on. A guy with a mask confronts him about him not wearing a mask, and they got into this verbal argument. And then the guy without the mask is he's carrying appendix. He draws his gun and points it at him. And threatens to kill him that's a felony and that's how right. you end up in jail. so right so everything from the story makes it sound that this person he was you know he was legally carrying all all of that stuff so why why on earth would he do something like that so in the end he he leaves gets in a car takes off police uh you know put his picture up from surveillance video and they eventually caught up with him so, what's that I said it was aggravated assault. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, in every state, it's going to be different. But in Washington state, yeah, that's aggravated assault. And and the reason is if, if you present a weapon and you display it in a manner where a person can reason, they, they reasonably feel like that weapon is going to be used against them, then that's aggravated assault. So if yeah. I point my weapon at someone and say, I'm going to kill you, everything is that, you know, everything has been met for that person to feel like you probably have the intent to kill them. And if that wasn't a crime, we would just allow people to point guns at people all the time and, and right. threaten their lives. Like, of course that should be a crime. And that goes back to exactly what I said. 
unless they're presenting some type of deadly threat or, or threat of serious bodily injury, the weapon does not, it, it's a non issue. Never known. It's non, it's never known because a, if you, if you pull that weapon out and we've already touched on this several times, you're now interjecting a firearm into a confrontation. Yeah. Where fi- two seconds earlier, there was a confrontation that did not have a firearm involved. And unless you plan on shooting somebody, waving that thing around and yelling and, and, and like displaying what you have, it's not going to resolve the situation at all. It's going to do the complete opposite. It's going to cause panic. People are going to start screaming. Like if that guy pulled his gun out because they were in an argument over a mask, that other dude had full justification to shoot him right there. You know, like, I don't understand what he hopes to gain by right. a firearm into an argument over a mask. Cause right. he's scared and he knows he can't fight right. his way out of a fucking wet paper bag. <laughs> And and Todd asked the question: Do we know that the other guy didn't? Realize Let's say Greg is on the store, <laughs> right? Yeah. And now he becomes a target, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Even if he don't want to shoot, just want to scare people, you know. Yeah. Not good thing to do. People yeah. are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> not you, people. I'm just saying. Not the ones that are watching. A lot right of now, people, though. but yeah. no, I mean, and, and that goes back because I just did a whole podcast on concealed carry. Yeah. Like, if you are going to carry a firearm in your waistband, you need to at least do the bare minimum of educating yourself on the laws, the legality of it, when is appropriate to display it, when is it appropriate to engage somebody. Because if you don't do that, like, and, and again, I'm going to throw my own mother under the bus. She bought a 38 revolver and just keeps it in her purse and walks around with it. I'm like, you, you don't do train, you don't yeah. train. You, you've never been to the range with that weapon. You don't understand like conflict resolution. You don't understand mm-hmm. armed combat. Like all of these things that you need to do to understand why that firearm should be in your purse. A lot of people aren't doing it. And you're the only person that you're going to, you're doing a disservice to is yourself. Like if you have made the choice to find a firearm that you like and purchase it and get your concealed carrying. And now that's part of your, your daily life. I feel like you're obligated to go become educated on it, become trained on it. And and now at least have somewhat of a proficiency with that weapon. You know, I think. And and, uh, let me reiterate all these things that Greg is saying that you really need to do. uh, If you're going to carry a gun is not to go and like, you don't need this stuff to go off and fight Al Qaeda. You need this stuff to survive and protect your family in potentially your first gunfight. Yeah. Right. And, a gunfight is a gunfight, whether it's happening in freaking Podunkville, wherever, or Ramadi, Iraq, or, you know, it doesn't matter. Bullets are bullets, and they do the same thing. You know, if you're going to carry a gun to potentially get into a gunfight, which is that's what you're carrying it for. You're carrying it to defend yourself and your loved ones or maybe a third party from from death or, or or severe bodily injury in a life or death situation that's a gunfight like you need to have these skills to hopefully survive it and i think if you if you feel you're responsible enough to carry that then you should be responsible enough to become educated on it and put yourself through the proper training and i always like to mention like i don't think that this should be mandated i don't think it should be like a, a government required course i don't even think people should have to have a concealed carry license because that starts to sound like an infringement to me but the government shouldn't have to tell you like make sure that you're at a certain level of proficiency you should have to make make sure you're at a certain level of proficiency just as a person that's decided to carry so there rant right. over rant over on that one yeah, you should be enough to go out and get training, yeah, get training on your own. And the other thing that I always tell people to do, it's it's just like any other aspect of life. Anybody need water? Um, you good? Dude, good, find good. find a mentor, find someone that's better than you, that can kind of walk you through the steps and and teach you about the fundamentals of firearm safety, teach you about you know like speed versus accuracy, combat shooting versus just plinking targets at the range, like all of these different things. Yeah, you can watch YouTube videos and you can go out and you can kind of get a little understanding of some of these things. But until you have someone there to kind of walk you through this, it's going to be exponentially more difficult to try and figure that out on your own. 
And since we haven't used a jujitsu analogy in a long time, I think it's important to say, <laughs> like, like, that's the hey, time. That is the time. Uh, hey, oh, you if you got two shot? white belts that don't know anything and they're training each other, yes, there are certain things they can learn, but it's not even going to be comparable to the white belt that grabs a black belt and said, hey, can you show me this? Can you show me that? Right. Firearms is no different. Find someone that knows what they're doing, either a friend or a family member, or you might have to pay for it if you don't know anybody. But it's a necessary step to at least get yourself to a level where you'll be comfortable carrying that weapon and, and confronting somebody in armed conflict. I, mean, I, I have experience in my, my own experience because I never had like the proper, let's say, the like cops, right? You have like a training for this, for that. I never had. I was just a civilian. Then I thought was should, I should have a gun because I have family. <clears throat> and I was... I was doing good, doing seminars all over the world, and then I started like making money, start saving money at home, you know. So I thought like, well, I need a, I need a gun. And man, you know what I did? I started like practicing, you know. I started like watching videos, YouTube videos, and I bought like a BB gun first that works just like a Glock. And then I start practicing with the BB gun, you know, like not even shooting. They're just playing around, magazine on, off, racking, pointing, and practicing before I got the gun, you know. And then I finally got the gun. And then I start going to the range next, uh, close to my to my house, and start like once, twice a week shooting, 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 shooting. You know, in the beginning, bro, you shoot, and then you don't even see where the the, the bullet goes. Right. You're like, man, possible, you know, like where this thing goes. <laughs> <laughs> like you're shooting, and the things appear, bro. Start. It's on the target next to you. Kind of, you know, like you don't see where the thing goes, you know. Well, bro, I start practicing and little by little, I start getting better, better. Of course, I I, I have Greg. We, we went to the sh uh, shooting range a few times. I have another friend, start going, start going by myself to the point where watching videos and practicing, drawing the gun, quick draws, quick draws, quick draws, like on the, on the bathroom. You know, like in front mm -hmm. of the in mirror, the mirror. Yeah. Yeah, to the point where, bro, I, I go shooting the guys and I'm, I shoot well, you know, I mean, I'm not a Navy SEAL, but I shoot pretty well, you know, like I remember Greg was like, you don't have, you're you professional, you know, like, Navy SEAL. Yeah, Greg, Greg was like, kind of, you know, like, man, you're a professional, you know, like, <laughs> Draw just, good. tink, 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 watch, I'm going to go inside and get, <laughs> get a snack or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, man, then you don't need to, to, to have like spend all that money you know, man, you can do things at home, you know, that are going to make you better. Of course, if you look for, it's like jiu-jitsu, man. You can watch things, you know, learn a little bit, practice here, the friends here and there, the, the friends who knows, you know. It's not the same thing as going to the to the, to the the school and learn properly, you know, pay a class and, and make it. But you can you can make things, you know, man. I believe you can make things that practice at home and, and, and dry fire, you know. I just wrote mm -hmm. a whole, whole article on that for and tactics and preparedness magazine. And you and, and you get turn. you get used to the gun. You get used to the to the sound of the gun. The the the, the, the you know the the whole thing uh, around the gun. And um, man, at some point in my life, I thought I should carry. You know, because I had some problems and I felt like I should just carry. But I ended up not needing. You know, like I, I felt like man, you know what? I never needed so far. I'm gonna keep my guns at home. So. You know, like yeah. I'm safe, family safe, everything inside safe. You know, but at the end of the day, I, I don't even feel like, man, I, I, I need the protection for a gun. Like, I, I, I didn't feel the, the need for that. You know, and and the day the I, I, I went there, I apply for for concealment, and, and I went there, talked to the cops and stuff, the the sheriff, and they were kind of, man, you you know a lot, like have a gun, you know, I have the 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 the, the, the permit, the permission, and I'm like, you know what? Let's let's that let's leave for the next time. Let's yeah. see let's see what happened in between now and the next time. I feel I need, you know. Let's see if I'm gonna feel the the feeling of needing, you know. And at the day at the end of the day, man, uh, the gun became like my 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 friends, you know. I have Greg gave me a gun, it has my name and everything, you know. It became my my baby, you know. <laughs> you know, and uh, bro, it's 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 my it's my adult it's my big people toys you know right, like right. i love going out with the guys shooting you know practicing i practice like uh, <clears throat> uh the self-defense with the, the blue gun and stuff at the gym like once twice a month everybody loves you know it's super fun it's one of the nicest training sessions you have and uh you know but 
I don't rely just on the gun, you know what I mean? I don't feel, oh, no, the gun, if I have the gun, I'm going to save my life, you know? Because I know what comes with that. You yeah. know, I know I'm not the, the most calm person in the world, you know? I might do some bullshit, you know? <laughs> if I get if I get, if I I get get pushed enough, yeah. pushed to, through a line where I can control myself, yeah. you know? So to avoid problems, I just like, well, man, let's keep at home, you know? If I feel I need, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after, you know? But it's, uh, I think it's a lot of responsibility, you know, know what you're capable of or the things you shouldn't be done and you, yeah. you probably will, you know. <laughs> Definitely and, changes and your life. You measure know. that, you know, because the last thing I want is it's save the world and go to the jail, you know, like yeah, yeah. shoot the wrong person or, you know, yep. or go too much. You know? Yeah, absolutely. But that's such an important perspective to share because I think a lot of people get that gun and and now it's just yeah i'm ready to go instead of really taking a like a, an in-depth look at yourself like what are my triggers or or is this potentially going to put me in a scenario where i'm going to end up getting in trouble or i'm going to end up doing something stupid because there's fuck dude there's a lot of guys that goes zero to a hundred oh yeah fast. oh yeah the you problem know? if they have and a now gun if you're interjecting you know? a gun into yeah that whole right scenario. exactly and, exactly. and I, I fucking worry about that with myself still even with a lot of firearms training like i'm ready to fight to the death on i5 if somebody like flips me off you know like fuck it let's go you know like my wife's trying to stop it you're being stupid i'm like no this is it's serious I need, is, I, need, I need that guy's he needs to die he flipped me off you know <laughs> And so I get that. And that's a real thing. Hey, hey, easy. I resemble that remark. Right? <laughs> yeah. You can just wave. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just wave. wave with the gun. Yeah. <laughs> My road rage has gotten a lot God. better. Yeah. Mine has too. It was bad for a while. It was real bad. And it's funny because like I I never even put it together until like literally like a year ago. I was talking to one of my CAG buddies because he almost killed this 82nd like private coming off of fort bragg and he's a he's a delta dude he's like this fucking kid was riding my ass and he then he fucking honked at me and i was like you know what i don't give a fuck 20 years special operations like i didn't give a fuck dude i pulled over and i was like if he fucking has a problem he's dying today and it's like what but and he's, he's like, and he's very serious and like he's, he's like, not no, throwing he that no. term around and he's That's like the thing and then the guy just fucking drove by and it's like almost like he was let down yeah and then we started talking and it's like every dude that i deployed with has some fucking deep seated road rage problems because that's where we were always attacked, you know. Bro, I'll say this: I was telling this story the other day. When I would come home from rotation, I wouldn't drive for the first month. I'd, I'd make my, I guess, girlfriend slash then wife uh -huh. drive me around for the first month. One month, I would not drive. You're ready to because pit, motherfucker. Because I would be, war. I would pit, and I like there were a couple of times first first couple rotations home. Someone backing out of their driveway in front of me, and I'm ready to fucking, ready to fucking ram through, drive through, you know? No bullshit. Pit motherfuckers. I'd stop the car middle of the road. Fucking, get out. Like, think, think, let's go. Come on, get out of the fucking car. So I just decided for a month, I'm not driving anymore. Yeah, it'd probably have been a good, a good thing to implement. Yeah. Post deployment. I don't do that anymore, though. I'm calm, cool, collected. So who's driving home? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sober. I'm, water. Right. I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't road rage anymore. I'm a, I'm a Thanks, esteemed man. business owner uh, yeah. in a local community. Right. All right. I think that's where we're going to wrap it up. Huh? Brandon. Yeah, this was, I, I enjoyed this. I wasn't saying anything, but this was awesome. You know, people were like, Brandon, we feel like you're left out this whole conversation. I, I saw some of those comments, yeah. Whatever. You know, we had some special guests in town, so here they were. And might yeah, not no. have been all about guns. Hey, I it might have been a I lot about you guys jiu -jitsu. having me on. If, uh, if you want to be inundated with more jujitsu talk, feel free to check my podcast out. Yeah. The endless endeavor. Endless endeavor. Endless endeavor. Yeah. When are you filming the next episode of that? I think we're doing one tomorrow. Here. Yeah, yeah, like right here tomorrow night. I think. Right here, we're filming one. Yep, we're doing so yeah, check it we'll out. Just, on... We'll just rehash out right. all the same. Right. We'll just <laughs> repeat the same thing. So check that out on YouTube. I'll post the link in the uh, comments here. Apple. What's the other Spotify, one? Spotify. Spotify. All of them. All of them. Any more questions coming in? Not... Does anybody else have any questions? What about is your chair? No. I know I did see 
Jessica asked what everybody carries. They know what we carry. What do you? What's your carry gun? That's a Glock nineteen. That's a surprise. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I get a lot of hate from my buddies that are anti Glock people, but the reality of it is, you have buddy. Do you? Uh, yes, unfortunately, they're your buddies. There, there are people that don't like Glocks, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I touched on this on my episode. Like any of the major firearm manufacturers yeah. are going to right. build a quality weapon that you can rely on that's going to run. But at the end of the day, I've been carrying Glock since 2003 professionally. Mm -hmm. And now if I pick up a SIG or, or an XD, it yeah, just it feels different. It just feels weird. Yeah, it feels, it feels off. And so it is what it is. Look, I had I had a manufacturer. I have Glocks because yeah. of Greg. Yeah. 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 I'm a Glock guy because of him. Yeah. yeah. So. And same thing. And I'm not a Glock <laughs> fanboy by any means. But, you know, I had, I had a manufacturer of another well-known, reliable combat pistol company they say, hey, I want you to start shooting our guns. What will it take? And I basically said, you would have to pay me to shoot your guns. One million dollars. One million. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, yes, I carry a Glock for a living still. Um, and if I was going to switch my Glocks, then I'd have to switch like hundreds and hundreds of dollars of worth of holsters and potentially magazine, magazine pouches yes. and then magazine well, magazine plates magazines like you name it like you know so it's just well let me ask you guys a question, go bang. Then, since you're way more dialed in on this shit. a 19 i mean it's a it's a fairly small firearm but even a 19 it's kind of big if you're like in in sweats or you're just going you're yeah. walking the dog yeah. so i was thinking of either getting the 43x mm -hmm. or the 45 okay not the glock 45 but the right. nomenclature yeah, yeah. 45 yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what what's your thoughts on that for your like i'm in shorts and a t-shirt and i'm just going for a walk carry so um for me the 43x kind of defeats the purpose a little bit of the 43 right because what really prints is the the width the grip. and the length of the uh -huh. grip right let's check out your hand size well yeah you're tiny no i mean you got big hands too same shit all right same, same hands shit. Same let's let's done that before in like jujitsu or something. Like let's Everybody's compare some other hands. stuff after we're off. There was a gun. Yeah, gun <laughs> just uh, the hands. Go. So no, but the, the regular forty three, it's only like it, it's halfway up my. You carry with agreed. agreed. So I carry a forty three with the standard stock base plate in the gun, and extender. then I carry a spare mag with a plus three extender on it. Got it. Now when I we're gonna go over this tomorrow, but when when I talk about my grip and shooting majority of my grip is fulcruming where on the pistol yeah at the top right? up high yeah. right where i'm clamping the gun with the meaty muscular portion of my hands so i don't care how much you're gripping the gun down here so the fact that my pinkies are hanging off the, it feels awkward mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually affect the management of recoil for me i carry depending on my dress glock 43 or a glock 19. okay Right. Uh, Glock 43 is for board shorts and a tank top. We're going out on the boat. Yeah. Um, sometimes if I have to go to a formal event with my wife and I've got to wear a suit and tie with my shirt tucked in, I wear my Glock 43 in a tuckable holster with my dress shirt tucked in because it's so flat and thin. Um, if I'm going into the city, I'll change my dress and I'll carry my Glock 19 with a spare mag. Um, if we're going and doing Which we made a video on that. That'll be coming out soon on the YouTube channel, right? On the Glock 19. Yeah. Oh yeah. The yeah. city. The city. Oh yeah. Well, that's for now. Setup. That's that's our E EDC. The e. Our enhanced EDC, EDC carry. Yes. So I, I think the 45. Refresh my memory. The 45 is the. It's the 40. It's a it's a single stack. It's basically. I might no. be fucking this up. I think no. it's a nine millimeter. That's a single stack. Yeah. Right. 45. Yeah. The 45 is the. The uh, 19X, but in black, the 19X. right? Yeah. yeah. So what's, what's the the You're thinking 48. 48. The 48. So, oh, a single stack yeah. nine millimeter? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the 48. So it's like a 19 stack, size, but, but narrow but single stack. Yes. Right. So it's a, single, it's a 19 frame size, but single stack. So Got it's it. narrow. Okay. That's right? what I was thinking. Which for me, if you're going to carry something that big, Might as well. if you look at the, if you actually look at the measurements, it's like, point something something of an inch wider hey, every, or every but then with the every with those mags down. i have you have the same capacity as every a 19, 19 right which, so that's that's the difference the uh what's that it's shield arms shield arms the s15 yeah they make a mag for the glock 48 
that allows you to carry the capacity of a Glock 19 Got in it. the 48, but in a in the 48, so mm-hmm. in a single stack width. That sounds like witchcraft. Yes, we can yeah, look at that. That's like you can touch pistol. guns on live. I saw. I can't apparently. Hear this. That it apparently cannot touch that. How gun. close can I get before? I mean, <laughs> I'm not touching out. it. I'm they might shut it, it off. It's like, like my five year old. I'm not touching it. I'm not. The lights will cut out. The mics will cut out. Facebook and YouTube right now has just got their finger on the button. Wait, right? They're like, but you touch one of those guns. To answer your question, kind of, you know, and I know we receive these questions a lot from the audiences. I try to stay as consistent as I can with my. I'm not a gun guy. I'm. I'm actually not. Yeah. Okay. I have, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not a yeah. gun guy. I have a few. How many, gun, how many guns you own? What's a gun guy? That's not a fair question. <laughs> What's a gun guy? <laughs> What's a gun guy? How many different types of guns do I have? So I have. I have. I'm not a gun guy. I probably have three, sixty five, guns. In my safe. I have five I'm Glock 19s. Okay. I have five Glock 19s. Right. One of them is stays in one spot on my house. The other is my carry Glock 19. The other three are loaner Glock 19s that I have for clients when they come in, they need to borrow a gun or friends, they need to borrow a gun, right? I have a Glock 17. The Glock 17 is my factory uh, Ipsic gun, nine mm-hmm. millimeter Glock. I have my Glock 43. That's my toting around town. I'm in, you know, leave it to Beaverville and I don't really, I'm not really worried too much. Uh, and then I have a few ARs, five five six chamber five five six. I've got my tote gun, a little satchel man purse gun, and then I've got my precision guns. Everything that I have, you talk about distance management. Fighting's about distance yeah. management, right? So everything that I have is managing the distance, but I don't have anything other than Glocks. I don't have anything other than Glock nine millimeters. Um, I don't have any fancy ARs that are in anything other than five five six. Uh, I have one 308 bolt gun. I'm sorry. I have one 308 gas gun, which is like my mid range, mm-hmm. you know, precision rifle. And then I have my six, five Creedmoor bolt gun, which is my mile long gun. Um, and then I do have now currently because of the thing, the series that we've been filming, I have Rattler. my SIG Rattler for my enhanced EDC that I can carry in my 300 bag, blackout, which is 300 blackout, which apparently according to apparently you're wrong, I'm wrong. But that guy can. And Paul Harris is that guy right. can suck star because he something. builds meat bags and shoots them. So you're right, wrong. exactly. <laughs> There's a real guy named Paul Harris. Yeah, you're not. Oh, well, yeah. There's a Paul Harris in the gun. Paul Harris means something else in the DJ. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go there. <laughs> so, all right. Damn. So there's that. There's that. What 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 makes a guy a gun guy? Is a gun collector. Uh, Right, like a gun collector, like oh, I got this new 1911. You got to check it out. Oh, I got this new Walther P99. You got to check it out. Oh, I got the new FN. A guy with like right? a wall behind him a that has a, a bunch of more like enthusiasts, <laughs> like more like enthusiasts, like a gun enthusiast. You know, like I mean, well, one of my mentors always said, so. "Are you are you a <laughs> piano collector or are you a pianist?" Right, right. Um, you know, so for me, like the gun's a tool for me, huh. and that's it. It really is a tool. I don't have sexy guns. I don't have fancy guns. I don't have any fancy like Zev Tech or Agency Arm fancy Glocks. My Glocks are factory Glocks that I take a Dremel to and grind down myself and stipple it myself. They're mm-hmm. ugly as shit. And they got blood stains on the slides and holster wear like crazy. From your and- enemies? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> From my thumbs. <laughs> and they're kind of dirty, you know, and they're not pretty. And but they work. And they well, that's, what I, that's one thing I love about Glock. You could bury it in the dirt for a year. Oh yeah. And you could dig that thing up. It's gonna run. Yep. Yeah. Goes bang. Goes bang. I'm just blocking a user real quick. All right, cool. I wonder what they say. I'll tell you after. All right. Dang. Sorry, you guys. Have missed All right. right. Well, you got anything else, Brandon? I think we're gonna wrap it up. No, I think. Yeah, went over a lot of stuff. That was awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was cool. fun. We'll do this again tomorrow night, apparently. Let's go. That's so if y'all want to see the next uh, edition of this. But it won't be live, will it? No, it won't be live, right? So it'll come out, <laughs> I don't know, in a few weeks. Or, 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 or yeah, it's yeah, every weeks. Thursday. Okay. Yeah, every, couple weeks. Every Thursday. Nice. Follow him on the Endless Endeavor. Endless Endeavor. I'm a Greg, too, so I'll do it. couple Gregs. Greg it. squared. Cool. Right. All right. All right. Thanks for being on. I'm going to hit end broadcast now.
Salut, Salut.